Steven is a developer relation, the developer advocate at the Angular team. So he is the right person to ask all the Angular questions. Yes, so uh, let's go with the first one. What plans for development of the framework exist for the Angular team to successfully compete with React and Vue? So I'm gonna first react to the question and then I'll, I'll see if I can answer the, the sentiment behind it. So uh, first, we, we don't try and compete with other frameworks. Um, we really believe that um, kind of across the, the software development ecosystem, there are a lot of different choices in the, ecos uh, like in the ecosystem. A lot of them are open source. Uh, and in general, this is really good for developers. It means that we're gonna have more ideas coming into the, the fold. There's gonna be more ways of doing things. Uh, some people have preferences about whether they like more functional program, more object-oriented program. There's all sorts of kind of preferences and ideas that the developers have. Uh, and so we, we really try not to compete with, with other frameworks. Um, I mean, we want good things for them. We want good things for ourselves. Um, but so uh, the way maybe I'll, I'll kind of react to the question. Uh, first of all, I, I would ask back a little bit. And maybe you can put some more questions into the uh, chat here is, why are you, you asking that? I mean, so are, are there things uh, in Angular that would make you not want to choose Angular because hopefully we, we're building a framework that solves your problems and makes your lives easier. Um, in terms of our, our biggest kind of challenges today, uh, we, we've uh, kind of gotten to a point where Angular is very, very good, very, very popular. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll give some kind of numbers on that. Uh, so there was a, a study that was just done um, Gonna pull up the information. Uh, so it was a company called uh, Developer Economics by Vision Mobile. Uh, they did a state of the developer nation analysis in Q1 of 2017. Uh, and so one of the things that they saw was that 11% uh, of all developers uh, across kind of all the ecosystems they serving, they serving like 50,000 people, I think. 11% uh, used AngularJS, 10% uh, used Angular. Uh, the next highest was 9% for any sort of framework or library. So. Uh, from those numbers, from the, the way that they were querying, uh, we're actually doing very well. Um, so we've only been around a, uh, for about a year. So it was September 14th, 2016, when we finally hit 200 um, of Angular. And since then, we, we've seen kind of a huge, uh, tremendous amount of growth. So we had a lot of kind of early adopters that were using Angular uh, prior to that date. Um, I think people have been with us since the alphas, the betas, the RC period. Uh, but since that 200, it, it, things have kind of changed. It, it's now become okay in a company to say, let's choose Angular, right? It's not uh, beta anymore. It's uh, achieving kind of a, a widespread popularity. Um, some of the numbers that we're seeing across the internet are something like 30% or more of month over month growth. Uh, and just based on the, the data that I've seen, that's, that's uh, one of the, the fastest uh, growth kind of trend lines for any framework or, or technology that I've seen. Um, definitely faster than AngularJS um, and faster than uh, some of the other ones that I've looked at. Uh, so I guess, why would you choose Angular? So we, we talk about this kind of, uh, or at least I, I have five main reasons that I talk about um, that, that this is typically more of a business, business decision maker. So your CTO, your, your man, development manager, uh, why do they care? Why is it okay to pick Angular? Um, so we talk about Angular being uh, opinionated. So we are really, uh, is, is composed to a lot of, as, um, in different, uh, from a lot of other technologies out there, we're trying to be kind of a full platform solution. So end-to-end -end developer experience, everything from getting started with a project to uh, figuring out the best practices to uh, taking advantage of some of the cooler new, newer technologies that we should all be taking advantage of as developers like server-side rendering, uh, PWAs and service workers, all the way to how do I deploy my application uh, in production and be successful. Um, so this, this level of opinionation, the fact that we're, we're kind of bringing all these different pieces together and saying, we know these work together. And while you still have the freedom to swap out different bits of it, um, we've tested them, they're validated, they're, they're brought to you by the same kind of team with the same focus on VX uh, is, is very, very helpful. So, so it's trustworthy, or excuse me, that was opinionated. The next one is trustworthy. Um, we have a very public uh, kind of six month tick cycle of major releases. We have very predictable miners, very predictable um, patches. And, and this is really beneficial to a lot of companies because you know that Angular is going to be continue to be invested in. You, uh, you can kind of very publicly see when things are coming, when change is coming. Uh, and so that's, that's a, a lot of predictability in terms of being able to schedule out a year, for example. 
Um, and while we're trying to make all of those uh, breaking changes as easy as possible, and I, I think we've done a fantastic job with four and we're getting even better with uh, the upcoming V5, uh, this is something that we want to hear your, your feedback on. But we, we do feel like uh, because we're, we're kind of making this longer term plan and making that public, uh, we, we have a huge amount of trustworthiness. Um, we also talk about Angular being um, scaled. So there, there's a couple of different ways. So obviously Angular is really good for solving Google scale problems. So there's I think more than 300 projects at this point within Google uh, that are using Angular. Uh, but we also talk about Angular being scaled for um, kind of complex teams. So often it's not just one developer sitting in a room building an application, right? You have a large team. So you need things like types to make the code maintainable. You want things like, uh, like we have ng modules, which can be the architectural building blocks that are uh, from an architectural standpoint, we have things like uh, declarative templates. So if uh, a designer knows some HTML, they can get in, they can tweak things, they can add CSS directly to those components. Um, and so you can have very rich kind of collaborative teams working on Angular projects together. Uh, so we've done a community trustworthy uh, scale. We also talk about um, Angular being, uh, having a really good ecosystem. We at this point have kind of hundreds of different companies and projects out there. Uh, building really cool tools. This was one of the biggest strengths of AngularJS was this awesome community. Uh, and we're, we're already seeing that the Angular community is kind of surpassing those expectations in terms of all the cool things that they're building um, and the ways that they're helping developers. And I think one big thing that we're seeing that we, we didn't necessarily see as much in AngularJS uh, is large companies building for Angular. So you've got companies like uh, VMware building the Clarity library, where internally they use Angular, and so they're exposing those components out to the rest of the world to make, help everyone benefit. Um, just checking real quick here. Uh, the last one is uh, Angular being familiar. So uh, we talk about Angular being familiar from a couple different perspectives. So uh, I work with a lot of our educators. So this is companies that are training and teaching Angular. Uh, and about half of the students going through uh, and learning Angular are coming from AngularJS. So they're, they're JavaScript developers who have a background um, with some of the philosophies and concepts from the team. But then the other half are backend developers coming from .NET and Java. Um, and what we hear is that Angular for a lot of them feels like coming home, right? You're getting the, the best of this great user experience from building a single page application and shipping it using web technologies. Um, but it has a, a very application-like mentality that, that a lot of developers really love. So in general, uh, we, we try not to compete, but I, I think we, we've kind of proven that Angular is a really great choice uh, for a lot of different developers and a lot of different companies. Uh, and we're really happy with how fast it's growing, uh, meeting our expectations. The next two questions seem to be about Angular 1. So the first one, is there a solid answer to end-to-end to end and to end of life of Angular JS support. There are various hearsay and bug answers in discussion threads, GitHub issues. And then the other one seems similar. Oh, okay, let's. Uh, it's not very similar. Let's let's go with right. this one first. I'll answer them each of them. So the first question is: Is there a solid answer to end of life for Angular JS support? Um, there is not a solid answer. So the the thing that the team has said publicly is that we are going to continue to invest in Angular JS until. Uh, most developers, uh, according to the metrics that we collect, have switched over to Angular. Um, I, I think that that is an okay way of doing it, um, but I think we, we may have already hit that point according to some metrics, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to end of life AngularJS uh, anytime soon necessarily. Uh, it, it really depends what you mean by AngularJS, uh, right? or what you mean by end of life for AngularJS, because for us, it's still a open source project. It's still something that uh, kind of millions of people use. And so we're, we're still gonna care about it and worry about that. I mean, um, but a lot of the architectural problems, like most of the bugs that people file against AngularJS uh, are things that we've already fixed in Angular. Um, and so we're really focused on how can we help AngularJS developers um, become Angular developers uh, almost because that, that we feel like is the best way to help them build better applications rather than going back and making kind of sweeping changes to AngularJS, which would break everyone's code and cause them to, to make changes. Um, so no solid answer there, but uh, we're gonna continue kind of what we're doing for the, um, for the foreseeable future, near term, medium term. 
so this question disappears. And next one is, hi Steven, we're using Angular 1. How would you recommend to justify the cost put into upgrading to Angular 5? Thanks. And one thing I would like to add, uh, in the beginning we had a quick uh, survey, and out of about like 100 people, 33% uh, say they're using Angular 4 plus, 25% say you're using AngularJS, and 17 some R framework, so. Okay, Yeah. so the majority are on Angular. Yeah, so 33%, uh, more people on Angular 5 than Angular 1. Okay, okay, uh, and I'll, I'll even correct you, Carol. So we, we use two terms uh, very intentionally. Uh, we use AngularJS for the, the 1X uh, older version, uh, and then we use Angular for 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 19, 42, uh, and so on. And the, the reason we do that is uh, we, we looked back at uh, kind of where we'd come from. So a lot of people had written books. Uh, there were kind of thousands of blog articles, posts, content, tutorials um, about AngularJS. Um, and then for about two years, we, we used this term uh, Angular 2. But then what we realized was uh, the community kind of needed a better indicator of stability and reliability. Um, and so we announced that we were switching to semantic versioning. And so that meant that that major version was going to continue changing uh, about every six months. And so we, we ended up looking back at kind of everything that came before and said, how can we rewrite the least amount of history? How can we keep as much content as valid as possible? Um, and so we came up with this uh, strategy that I, I think most people have, have adopted to. Uh, which is calling the new thing Angular, dropping the, the version number whenever possible because it doesn't really matter, uh, and then calling the old thing AngularJS. Uh, and and we're, we're coupling this with this idea that the code you write, the tutorials you write and read for version two are even saying that you read and write for version four, five, six, seven. So I mean, just like there are kind of minor changes across the web, you don't actually care what version of Chrome you're using, right? For, for the most part, there are, there are specific cases where you'll need to specify. But we want to see the exact same thing with Angular, where uh, all the code you wrote in 4 is going to continue working in 5, and you, you don't need to worry about it, right? There is an update process, but it's, it's straightforward. You're not rethinking, not rewriting your, your application. Um, so just, just a quick point on the terminology. Uh, how would you recommend that we justify the cost uh, of updating from AngularJS to Angular? Um, I would really look at the goals of your application. So it, it, the answer is kind of, it always depends. But for a lot of people, the complexity of maintaining an AngularJS application is much higher. Because a part of the reason that we rewrote uh, AngularJS as a team was that we, we had millions of developers building AngularJS applications. We had hundreds of thousands of applications across the web. Um, and the cracks started showing. And they, they were showing in ways that we couldn't fix with kind of a, a minor incremental update. Uh, so a, a great example of that is the way that we took our digest cycle from a, a cycle where we basically ran change detection until everything stabilized until it stopped changing uh, and shifted over to a component hierarchy uh, where we do a top-down depth first uh, pass of your entire application. Uh, and so that, that sort of kind of major shift solves a ton of problems that you had in Angular applications where you had too, or Angular JS applications where you had too many watchers. Um, and so it really goes back to what you're trying to get out of your application. Um, but for a lot of companies, they just leave their existing code in AngularJS or existing projects in AngularJS and they start new projects in Angular. Um, within Google, for example, we have large, uh, large projects uh, that were written in AngularJS that were slowly updating to Angular um, using ng-upgrade. Uh, an example of that would be Google Cloud Platform. So the management interfaces are historically AngularJS um, and now they're becoming Angular. Uh, and so for us, it was worth it to do the shift um, because of the uh, both easier to maintain the ongoing. So the, the code that you write in Angular is cleaner, it's, it's type safe, things like that. Uh, it's gonna get new features and new capabilities. So the, the web is continuing to evolve. We're seeing things like, sorry about this. My lights are going out. Uh, we're seeing things like ES uh, 2015 modules landing in the browsers. Um, and taking advantage of that in AngularJS is hard if not impossible, or it doesn't fit the mental model that we had in AngularJS at all. Um, whereas in Angular, we're really designed to take advantage of the kind of the next generation of the web. So service workers, progressive web applications, lazy loading, um, running code in a web worker, uh, building applications that run on mobile, um, take advantage of all these sort of kind of great things like server-side rendering. Um, a lot of those things aren't possible in Angular JS. Um, so by shifting over to Angular, you're going to save yourself money and time in the long run, uh, and you're going to build a better application for both your users and for your developers.
Next question. Uh, first of all, I love Angular. Thanks for your work. Do you plan to provide better examples and documentation on web workers, service workers, SSR, Mini, or Docs? Um, so I, I think this is something that we've heard uh, loud and clear that we want more documentation. Uh, we just did the first step uh, a few months ago, and, and we're finally kind of uh, ramping down on that project, which was rebuilding our Docs site. Um, so now all of the documentation for Angular is actually in the Angular repo. If you wanted to uh, contribute, it's all open source and it's all there on a self-hosting Angular application. Um, when, with regard to things like uh, service side rendering, there's awesome projects uh, like the one David East is doing. So he actually just filmed a video and wrote a couple blog posts about how you can take an Angular application, um, use Universal to render it out by the CLI, uh, and then upload that to Firebase and host that on Firebase functions. So um, David East and his work that he's doing uh, is fantastic, as well as the CLI team as part of launching Universal Support. Uh, they documented how to do those sorts of things. Um, so kind of this new policy as of a few months ago is that any new feature that ships has to have documentation or we don't ship it. Uh, so you saw that with server-side rendering in CLI, you saw that with the new HTTP client, um, you're going to be seeing that with service workers when they land. Uh, so these are, are kind of very good examples, uh, but we understand that we have not done the best job in the past and we, we want to continue to improve. Um, but collaboration and contributions always welcome. Uh, we can just do the when Angular CLI with customizable Webpack config of release. Actually, I would like to upload this one too. <laughs> All right. So when will the Angular CLI uh, support customizable Webpack? Um, so we want to make the Angular CLI customizable to solve any problems that developers have. Uh, let us know what those problems are. Let us know what you can't do today in the CLI. Um, but in general, we, we don't yet want to go down the path of having a Webpack config. Uh, if you need that, just do ng eject, and you'll get out a complete custom Webpack config as it is today. Um, and the reason we don't want to give you a Webpack config uh, is because the state of module loading is going to significantly and fundamentally change over the next 12 to 24 months. We, we have ES5 modules in some browsers. We don't have them in others. Um, but the way that they implement uh, the bundling process is very different, right? So for example, path resolution when it's happening at the Webpack level is different than what happens in the browser. And so uh, everyone that has import statements that wants to take advantage of newer uh, kind of ES5 module based or ES2015 module based uh, deployments to the server is going to have to go rewrite all their Webpack configurations. But the, the nice thing about not having exposed those developers is that if you're using the CLI, we can do those sorts of updates for you uh, behind the scenes automatically um, without you having to even worry about it. And so this is kind of this idea that Angular wants to build bridges into new kind of uh, technologies for building software without you having to learn anything. Um, and so that, that's an example. Uh, another example is this idea that uh, the Angular team wants uh, JavaScript compilation to not happen as a single unit. So Webpack thinks, let me go get everything in my dependency tree and then compile it all or bundle it all and then split out and uh, send out chunks to the, the file system. But for example, within Google, how we build Angular applications is we can actually build every ng module on its own. So if you have a large application with, I don't know, let's say a 4,000 components or uh, 10 or 30 different kind of modules that are lazy loaded from different teams in your company, you want to be able to compile each of those individually and then do a kind of more of an application release of all those different pieces. Um, that's not something Webpack can do. We're talking about uh, if there's ways that we can help them do that. Um, but there, there is another technology called Bazel that can do this, and that's what we actually use uh, internally at Google. And so, uh, for example, the CLI might, for uh, at some point, offer to build applications using Bazel instead, so that you get faster rebuild times, uh, incremental rebuild times, so we don't have to recompile modules that are already compiled. Um, Bazel today has its own challenges; it can't do things like lazy loading. Um, but we want to keep the CLI as much of a black box as we can, so that. We, we're not forcing everyone to go and update their configurations every time we want to take advantage of a, a new capability or um, help developers do kind of cool new things. Um, but that being said, we do want to make the CLI configurable. So definitely reach out to me um, on Twitter or, or however you want um, to let us know what you want to customize in the CLI. Uh, and we'll, we'll see if we can add that those as flags or options. The next question is about TypeScript decorators and what happens like once decorators are in the browser. Sure. Um, it's, it's, an, uh, it's an argument some use against Angular. Uh, I don't know why that would be an argument against Angular. Uh, in general, Angular uses things that are um, kind of slated for possibly becoming standards in the future. 
Um, so we, we lean a little bit forward, uh, not too far, um, just a little bit forward in terms of trying to take advantage of the, the newer capabilities that exist. Um, like like we, we used uh, zones, even though it was a uh, stage two proposal, I think. Um, if decorators end up getting finalized in a way that doesn't match Angular, um, we will have to look at it, uh, look at that spec at that time as we get closer to finalization to see what might actually ship in browsers, uh, what developer ergonomics are users expecting, uh, because uh, depending on what they end up looking like, maybe we could do a mechanical translation so that we just adopt the latest spec, or maybe we say, hey, this latest spec doesn't support some sort of capability and we can adopt it in halfway and then uh, have some other syntax for, for specifying metadata, things like that. Uh, so it, it's gonna depend entirely on what happens uh, with that, the decorator TC39 spec. Uh, and it would be too early to comment on right now, I think. You kind of touched on the next question. Does Angular support Semver and what will be the transition from four to five? Angular absolutely supports Semver. Uh, if we ever break you as part of a minor or a patch, uh, that's a regression and you should submit an issue and we should fix it uh, as another patch. Uh, we, we've done this occasionally, uh, I think three or four times in the last couple of major releases. Uh, how do we foresee the transition from four to five? So I, I gave a, a talk about what's new in Angular um, earlier in the month. Uh, what we did at the end of the talk is we actually ran a little workshop where we updated everyone uh, in the room, the, just whatever application they had on their laptop to five. Um, there were three issues and they were all related to libraries uh, who had already fixed but not deployed. And since then all three of those libraries have deployed uh, updates to make them compatible with five. So our goal is, is literally that it's even easier going from four to five than it was from going uh, from two to four. So you should just be able to run npm install uh, the, all the new packages or yarn add all the new packages. Um, and it should be, your code should just keep working if you're using uh, four, four in the right way, using the, the kind of latest standards. So if, if it's not that way, uh, let us know now because that we do consider, uh, while this is a, a major release, so going from four to five, we could break you. Uh, developer pain and stability is a huge thought in our minds and we don't wanna break people and we wanna make it very easy to transition. So we expect the vast majority of developers to run a single command and then they're using the latest version of Angular. Cool. Uh, the next one, is, is there a tutorial for contributing to Angular GitHub repo? So somebody wants to contribute to Angular and like it's not easy to start. Sure, sure. So there are a couple places where I'd recommend you begin. Um, the first is a tag that we, we should probably still need to get better at using called community hotlist. Um, so you can search for that uh, community hotlist uh, in the issue tracker. The other place that I would look would be um, in our documentation. So if you if you go into the Angular repo, you're gonna find a uh, angular.io uh, content section or doc section. Um, and it, that would be a really easy place to say, hey, I was reading this right. document. Uh, and let's thank Steven, everybody. Client works. Uh, make some sort of contribution, send a PR, um, and it will, will it, it's relatively straightforward. And we have a, a very welcoming community. Um, and so it, your issue will get looked at, it'll get triaged, um, and then hopefully uh, either your PR will get uh, merged or someone will say, hey, uh, we already fixed this over here, or here's um, a good uh, idea of how this fits into the Angular ecosystem. Um, I'll do the correct wording. Should I start studying Angular JS or just Angular? So uh, obviously you need to do, um, what's best for you. Uh, what I have seen is that uh, uh, obviously you're, you're probably earlier in your career, so you're, you wanna get hired um, for a job. I would say you're gonna be more successful going directly to Angular and not AngularJS. So there, there's still lots and lots of companies using AngularJS, so there's, there's lots of jobs, lots of hiring for that. Um, but Angular is actually simpler, um, but it's, it's based more on the modern web. So AngularJS, we, we invented everything from scratch, right? This was back in 2009. Uh, it was the days of jQuery. Um, and we said, what could building an application look like? And so we have all these kind of custom concepts. What we did when we moved to Angular was we said, hey, the web has advanced. And so there's all these great ideas that are now standards that we can take advantage of. So ES5 or ES2015 classes, uh, modules, um, all the, these sorts of kind of modern web technologies that we baked into Angular. Um, so Angular itself is simpler. Um, but then you, you're also learning the modern web at the same time, which makes uh, your kind of future job prospects uh, hopefully better. Uh, so the next one is, do you have any plans or ideas to improve reactive form, especially they care about ng model options or 
uh, update on or like ng model controllers for matrix parsers for angular js sure sure so um i don't actually know if there's any plans for improving uh reactive forms uh, but that's this is the sort of feedback that we're we're looking to collect um and so if you want to reach out to me i can i can follow up more directly about that question and we can talk about use cases uh and then maybe if you're interested we can even point you to um uh, the right place to, to write a design doc or implement a PR. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what's the reason of calling Angular Angular and not like circular or something? <laughs> um, so we definitely could have done that, um, but the this this decision was made, I think, a, a long time before uh, we exactly knew what Angular was going to be, um, and so it, it was a little bit too late. I mean, we already had. Uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of developers using Angular, um, or as we call it at the time, Angular 2. And so it was for us about rewriting the least amount of history. That's, that's fair. Uh, so next one is uh, Angular CLI release since 1.0 has been very unstable. And then there are a lot of bugs not fixed on GitHub regressions. And what's the plan to improve that? Sure. So, so this one is, again, surprising to me. Um, most people, I would even put the number upwards of 80 or 90% of Angular developers are using CLI at this point. Um, and they, they all have been very happy from, from everyone I've talked to. Uh, so I, I would very much like to hear what's, what's making you think it's unstable. Uh, included in our uh, regression to our end-to-end -end tests is basically we, we install version one of the CLI, we create a project, and then we update to the latest version and we, we make sure that the version that you've created with 1.0 of the CLI still works in the latest version of uh, the CLI. So that's actually part of our integration tests. Um, and then uh, it says many bugs on GitHub not fixed. Uh, if there, so in general, it's an open source project, so we get a lot of bugs, we fix a lot of bugs. Um, I'm not aware of any kind of major quality problems. Um, in general, bugs are not a, a measure of quality because I think it just means whoever popular. Um, but uh, so, so I would say ping me, let us know what regressions there are, because in general, uh, we, we get a lot of feedback right when a release goes out. Um, and then if there's a regression, we fix it uh, and we do another release. And in general, most people have been very, very pleased. Uh, I pass the microphone to Nihal to read the next questions. Are there any plans to streamline dynamic reactive forms? Right now, the amount of boilerplate is frankly annoying. Sure, so, so this is the same question as the other uh, question about improving reactive forms. Uh, if you have a, a proposal or some ideas or, or need, definitely reach out to me. Um, I'm not aware of any plans right now. Why AngularJS is not compatible with Angular? So if followed by, you know my migration from AngularJS to Angular costs money and time. Should we blame AngularJS designers team? <laughs> with a smiley face. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the team that built AngularJS is the same team that built Angular, so um, it would be uh, very odd to, to say, oh, those, those AngularJS guys. Um, uh, why is it not compatible? There were several things that would have had you rewrite um, most of your code anyway, so our shift to the component-based hierarchy, uh, that doesn't work at all with the, the scope and controllers that exist in a lot of AngularJS applications today. Um, our shift to uh, ES2015 modules and these sorts of things. So um, we're looking at if there's more we can do to enable backward compatibility or build a bigger bridge to AngularJS developers than the, the ng upgrade, which uh, we've got and is in use in a, a lot of kind of large companies with large code bases. Um, there, there's even a, a company started out there um, who they're working on mechanical translations from AngularJS to Angular um, using a, a semantic understanding of what goes on in an AngularJS application. Um, but uh, it, it, it is time and money, but in general, it's time and money that's, that's worthwhile. What do you not like the most about Angular? What do, does that mean all of the things I don't like the most? Or I assume that means what do I like the least? Among the list of you don't like, your which one is, comes first? Your favorite and favorite thing. Yes. Uh, my favorite unfavorite thing. Um, hmm. <laughs> there are that many. <laughs> so no, the the it, it's interesting because I, I have to separate my own perspective. I, I talk to developers all day um, about what they like and what they don't like about Angular, 
Uh, and so it, it's tough separating my own perspectives from, from that of everything I hear. Um, probably just the, the number of concepts to get started or, or maybe the perceived complexity of Angular is my, my least favorite part. So, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh my God, TypeScript. And then I show them, oh, you just put a colon and then the name of the dependency I want to inject. And then we, we resolve that reference directly via the token. Oh, that's not so bad. And then I can write the rest of my application in ES5 if I want. Oh, okay. Um, or, or things like uh, the, why do we have observables? So like HTTP, for example, returns observables. And people are like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you have an observable for something that's going to return zero or one time? Um, but then I, there's a, a lot of really good examples of where observables are very powerful. Um, like our HTTP library uh, returns observ uh, an observable. And what you can do is you can uh, chain that with a starts with operator. Um, and then about three lines of code, I can have a local storage cache that that observable synchronously immediately emits a cached version. Uh, and then as soon as the HTTP version uh, is resolved successfully, it emits this success the, uh, the full version of the data. And so, uh, it's very, very fast to say, let me take this online Angular application that was waiting to get data from the server all the time and make it respond instantly, but always with the directions data that the network is capable of delivering. So I, I think we're getting into the long tail here. I hope I don't have to answer all these questions. <laughs> uh, let's do three more. Okay. What are some benefits of using Angular Universal with Angular 5? Sure, sure. So um, I'll, I'll talk about this in two parts. So in general, you should use Angular Universal if you care about server-side rendering. Um, server-side rendering does two things. Uh, it increases the, or it decreases the perceived load time of your application so it looks done sooner, even though it might not actually be, um, because we're pushing down uh, fully rendered HTML to the browser. Uh, the second thing that it does is it increases the usability for machines that are browsing your website. So you've got a bunch of users who care about what it looks like, what it feels like, and then you've got a lot of machines that are browsing and trying to pull out like a thumbnail for Twitter, for example. Um, and so by using Universal, you get those thumbnails, you get uh, that kind of uh, scrapers are able to process your content without having to execute or understand any of your JavaScript. Uh, and then I'll just touch on very briefly uh, the, the V5 question uh, of why would I want to use Universal in V5. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've added uh, basically shims for a few of the DOM components uh, that third-party libraries expect. So if you were using some jQuery library or something like D3 that's making a lot of DOM manipulations, uh, those were much harder um, using Universal because you don't have any of the DOM, right? You don't have this uh, browser window to do all this work in. Uh, but we've done, we started adding in um, kind of implementations of some of these things. So in V5, it's a lot easier to work with third-party libraries in Universal. Cool. My Angular core team members do never speak on Angular NYC. I, I've spoken twice in Angular NYC in the last six months, um, but why don't we come out to New York City? Uh, I think it's just been uh, timing. Maybe I'll blame Carol for this one, because I've been in New York once. I'll probably be in New York next uh, again in the next four or five months. So we should definitely do it. Sounds good. And then, I, okay. I love Carol's logo, by the way. Angular NYC. I cannot wait to put one of those on my laptop. Oh, so you guys yeah. are an awesome community. That's this is a secret, but okay, now everybody knows stickers with Angular NYC logo are coming soon, so hopefully next meetup. Uh, any plan, okay, this is the last question. Any plan on of React Nano degree like video course for Angular? So I'm not familiar with the React Nano degree, um, but I'm familiar with the Android Nano degree. Um, I, I think we're planning to put together a bunch more video content in Q4. Um, one of the nice things is we have a, a very popular community of people that are creating videos all the time. Um, so the, the need is somewhat diminished. Like we're, we're very popular on Portal site. We're very popular on Egghead. There's sites like HiRes.io. So there, there's a ton of video content that teach you um, Angular already. Uh, we, we are looking to add more to that. Um, but if there's something specific that you're hoping to get out of a, a degree course or a, an online video set, let us know and we can help tune the future efforts using that. Cool. All right. Uh, let's thank Steven, everybody.